Welcome. In this session, I'd like to bring together many of the things we've talked about so far in this class, data, distributions, probabilities, into a final application. It's called simulations or Monte Carlo simulations, and talk about how we can use probability and statistics to do better data analysis and make better decisions. Let's start by telling, setting the table. In most analyses, at least in investing in finance, the way we do analysis is we have a bunch of variables that we care about and an output variable that we're trying to explain. But in trying to estimate these independent variables, we're often stuck with point estimates. You're saying, what are you talking about? Let's assume you're trying to value a company. Two key inputs in valuing a company, what's a revenue growth going to look like and what kind of operating margins are you going to earn as a company? In a typical valuation, I make you pick a number. Your revenue growth rate is 12%. Your margin is 8%. Now, obviously, you're not picking this number out of thin air. You're basing it on what you know about the company, the sector. It's a point estimate. It might be the most likely, your base case value, but you're uncertain about it. Your actual revenue growth could be higher or lower. Your margins could be higher or lower. The reason we've always used point estimates, though, is because we've had no choice. 30 or 40 years ago, getting the data to do a Monte Carlo simulation would have been daunting. And actually running a Monte Carlo simulation would have required expense that you and I couldn't, wouldn't have been able to bear. So now that things have changed, let's talk about how we can make simulations part of our arsenal. Let's start the process. If you think about what we're trying to do in simulations, is we're still trying to connect independent variables to an output variable that we're trying to explain. But now, instead of giving a single number for each independent variable, you put in a distribution. The example that I just gave you, where I talked about revenue growth and margins as your independent variables and value as the output variable, rather than just give me a revenue growth rate, what if you could give me a distribution of revenue growth that gives me an expected value of 12%. Remember, that was your point estimate, but also tells me what the range on that number could be. That could be as low as 4% or as high as 20%. Same thing with margins. So we're replacing point estimates with distributions. In a simulation, I go in and pick one number out of each distribution. So when I go to the revenue growth distribution, the number I might pick might be 18% or 5%. Let's say I picked 18%. I pick a number out of the margin distribution. Let's say it's 5%. I value the company. Then I do it again and again. Each time I run a simulation, I get a different value, an output value. I could run 100 simulations, I'm going to get 100 output values. My output from a simulation will be the distribution of the output variable. So rather than just saying the value of your company will be X, I give you a distribution of value. I know this sounds abstract, but we'll try this on a real company in a few moments, but that is what we're trying to do in a simulation. As a lead-in, before we actually look at the specifics of a simulation, a couple of things to keep in mind. If you're going to connect independent variables to an output variable, you need a model that connects them. And at the risk of stating the obvious, if that model is flawed, then I don't care how good your simulation structure is, you're still going to get flawed outputs. Start by building a base model that is sound. In building that model, a couple of pieces of advice. One is keep the model simple. Less is more. The fewer variables you have to worry about, the less work you have to do in your simulation. Second, try to keep your model transparent in terms of what's happening under the surface. Opaque models that have black boxes that you can't look into are much more difficult to simulate than models where you can see the connections and try to build them into your simulation. Now, one final decision you have to make is, you know, you might have a dozen independent variables and one output variable. So if you're valuing a company, there might be a dozen numbers that you view as inputs. Should you, in, in the real world, each of these numbers is uncertain. You could, in theory, build a distribution for each one. But you probably shouldn't. Because again, when you do a simulation, you want to focus on the variables that matter the most. So I would pick the variables that have the biggest effect on your output variable and the variables we feel most uncertain about. So out of the dozen variables, if you don't feel that strongly about nine of them changing, and you feel strongly about three, focus your efforts on the three that matter. So I'm gonna to try to do this on a real company, but before I do this, I need to let, set the table in terms of, you know, what kinds of uncertainties you will face when you approach an analysis. 
you have to start by looking whether the uncertainty phase is discrete or continuous. Take the examples of revenue growth and margins. The uncertainty phase there is continuous. Your margin is not going to take one of three values, 8, 12, or 16. It could be any number from 4 to 20. That's a continuous uncertainty. In contrast, let's assume the uncertainty you feel is about whether a regulation will change. That's a discrete uncertainty. It changes or it doesn't change. Zero, one, discrete. The risk can be symmetric, which is you can feel uncertain about the number being higher than expected or lower than expected. On both sides, you feel equally un uncertain. In some cases, though, your worries might be more on one side of the distribution. So, for instance, you might think that your margins are going to be 15%, but if you're wrong, it's more likely that you're going to get a big negative margin than a huge positive margin. That's an asymmetric uncertainty. And finally, you have to worry about you know, what, what's the chance of extreme values showing up on a particular variable. Because those are going to be more difficult to build. You've got to build in those extreme values into your distribution if you want your expected value to reflect that. Uh, you know, hark from the past, a few sessions ago, we talked about the choices of distributions. And if you get a chance, go back and revisit that session where I talked about symmetric versus asymmetric distribution. You know, fat-tailed versus thin-tailed distributions, discrete versus continuous distributions. In many simulation packages, you will be given a choice as which distribution you want to use for the variable you're trying to model. And in making that choice, I would strongly recommend that you go back and check out this flowchart because at least it's going to give you a sense of which distribution has, a be has the best chance of fitting the variable that you're trying to model. So let's try this out. Now, I do a lot of valuation of value companies. And in valuation, you usually do a base case valuation where you make your best judgments on revenue growth and margins and cash flows and you value the company. You come up with the base case value. Until about 10 or 15 years ago, that's when I would stop. But about 10 or 15 years ago, I was able to get access to, a, to an add-on to Excel that allows you to run Monte Carlo simulations. It's called Crystal Ball. It's one of three or four add-ons you can get to Excel. So here's the process I'm going to follow to convert my base case valuation into a simulation. I'm going to start by identifying what I think are the key drivers of value, the variables that I'm going to focus on the most in building my simulation. To make that judgment, I'm going to do what ifs on the variables to see which ones cause my values to change the most and also on the intuitive aspect of which ones do I feel most uncertain about, which are the variables that I think you know, could change the most from my expected values. Once I've identified the key value drivers, I'm going to collect the data. That data can either be historical data on, from my company and what that driver has done in the past. It can also come from looking across companies right now. So with revenue growth, the margins, I might look at margins across companies today to get a sense of what's high, what's low. Then I'm going to take that data that I've collected and try to find probability distributions and parameters for my key value drivers. So each value driver, instead of putting a single number, I'm going to put in that distribution. Now, if you have a simulation program that allows you to do it, you might then build in constraints and connections. In other words, when one variable changes, is another variable likely to change with it? Those are connections. And constraints and what a number cannot exceed or drop below. Then I'm going to run my simulations as many times as I can, 10,000, 100,000, a million times. And I'm going to come up with a distribution of value as well as percentiles, a histogram. So you can see what the 10th decile, I'm sorry, the first decile, the second decile, the third decile of the distribution looks like. So you ready? Let's get started. This was a valuation I did of Apple in May of 2016. Now, if you haven't taken my valuation class, this is going to look like, you know, it's going to look like Greek to you. But let me cut to the chase. I valued Apple at $126 per share. The stock was trading at 93. So the bottom line is I think the stock is undervalued. But in making this valuation, I made some key assumptions. One is I assumed that Apple is a pretty mature company and that revenue growth would be about 1.5% a year forever. I did assume that their margins, which, uh, which were 32%, would come under pressure. The smartphone business was maturing, that margins would decrease to about 25% over time. 
and that in creating the growth, Apple would get about a dollar sixteen revenue for every dollar in capital invested. My revenue growth determines the growth part of my story, not much growth here. My margins, I'm telling a story of declining margins over time. And the sales to capital ratio, I'm telling about how efficiently I can deliver growth. $1.6 of revenues for every dollar of growth. Those are point estimates. In discounting the cash flows, I used to cost a capital of 9.63%. I won't bore you with the details, but that again is a point estimate. With my point estimates, for these input variables, I get estimates for the cash flows and a point estimate of value. As I said, until about 15 years ago, that would have been game over. I'd have said Apple is undervalued. That's all I can say and move on. But if you ask me how, you know, how uncertain do you feel about each of these inputs that you've assumed, I'm going to be honest and say, look, I'm pretty uncertain. So let's try to make this a simulation. And here's what I'm going to start with. I took my four key inputs, revenue growth, margin, sales to capital ratio, and cost to capital. And I looked to see what would happen to my value if I changed those inputs. It turns out that revenue growth and margins have a big effect on value. Sales to capital doesn't seem to have much of an effect, and cost to capital has a very marginal impact. In other words, my value could go from 120 to 140, but it's not huge. So based on these what ifs, I decided to focus just on revenue growth and margins. It's a decision you got to make early in a simulation. You got to decide where to focus your efforts, your time. So to model revenue growth and uh, to get distributions for revenue growth and margins, I'm going to start by doing my homework. As I said, I can look at historical data on Apple's margins over time, its revenue growth over time, see what's happened because that, and there's something to be learned there. I'm looking to see how much a variable has changed over time. So if what I see for Apple is 1.5% growth every single year for the last 20, then maybe I don't want to do a distribution on growth. Second, I'm going to look at differences across companies on these variables. So with operating margins, you know, what do the margins look like across, you know, uh, across technology companies? That's going to give me a sense of what's high, what's low in this business. Along the way, I can't suspend intuition and common sense. I can bring that into play as well and say, you know what? Margins can't exceed 100%. No, market share cannot exceed 100%. These are common sense constraints that I can bring into the process. So I started by looking at Apple's historical data on both margins and revenue growth. Let me remind you again, I'm using 1.5% as my revenue growth for the future and about of 25% margin as my target margin. If you look across time here, you can see Apple's had good days and bad days. There is, there's the second coming, the first coming of Steve Jobs, the crash of Apple as it almost died in the 90s, the second coming of Steve Jobs, then you get the rise of Apple as a super company, the iPhone, the iPad. If you look at the revenue growth rate over this time period, between 89 and 2015, the revenue growth for Apple has been close to 17%. Now you can see already that the 1.5% that I'm projecting is way below that. Why is it way below? Because I'm bringing in common sense into play. 70% of Apple's value is coming from the iPhone, and the iPhone market, the smartphone market, which is where the bulk of this growth had happened over the previous 10 years, had started to slow down dramatically. If you look at the margins, the average margin over this period is 12.45%, but the margin is the, you know, there's have dropped to negative numbers, have been as low as 4%, as high as 25%. So I'm getting a sense, at least based on Apple's history, what a typical margin looks like, what growth rate looks like. And as I said, the big story for Apple in recent periods has been the iPhone. The iPhone has been the driver of Apple, and much of the spikes you see in Apple growth have come from a new iPhone model coming up. And it turns out that it almost follows a predictable cycle. The a new iPhone comes out, revenue spikes, growth spikes, and then the further you get from that new iPhone, the lower growth becomes. It shows you how de dependent Apple has become on the iPhone for growth, which is good news and bad news. It's good news because it's a cash machine. The bad news is the big growth days might be behind them. Finally, I looked at revenue growth across older tech companies because this is an aging company now. It's not the young Apple of 20, 30, 40 years ago. And if you look across older tech companies, the notion that tech companies are high growth companies is misplaced. Older tech companies 
revenue growth is actually less than 5%. So I'm looking at historical data, I'm looking at revenue growth across tech companies, and I'm using what I'm learning by looking at the data to inform the judgments I'm going to make about the distributions I will be using for revenue growth and margins. So now comes the part where I go back to the page. Second time in this packet you've seen this page and I'm trying to decide which distribution to use to capture my key variables. So I'm going to show you my choices and explain why I picked each one. But here's what I ended up using as my distribution for revenue growth and profit margins. For revenue growth, I used to log normal distribution. Why? Because I think with my 1.5% growth rate, if I'm going to have surprises, it's far more likely that I'm going to get upside surprises, that Apple somehow going to find a new disruption. Chance of it happening, I think, are very low, but I picked a right skewed distribution because I don't think you're going to get too many, too many outcomes on the negative side, which are vastly lower than minus 1.5%. So I picked the log normal distribution. It's centered around 1.5%. So my base case value is not changing, but my standard deviation gives me that long tail. For operating margins, I used an expected margin of 25%. But I'm going to use a very simple symmetric distribution for this because I feel pretty comfortable about the range around this number. I don't think Apple's margins are going to become 4 or 3 or minus 15% or 50%. I think it's going to be around 25% and I'm feeling, you know, given that my priors are not strong in either direction, I'm going to cap it at 35. I think that's the highest margin you're likely to get. That's a higher, I mean, it's higher than the existing margin, which is already at a high number. And the minimum margin is 15%. Essentially, by capping and flooring this distribution, I'm also preventing outcomes like a minus 150% margin or a plus 250% margin, neither of which is feasible. Log normal distribution, triangular distribution. Notice the expected values are the same as I had in my point case estimate. I then said, okay, before I go further, should I, you know, is there a likelihood that the variables that I am un uncertain about that there's some linkage between them. Put simply, I'm uncertain about revenue growth and margins, but do the two move together? In other words, when I get a surprise and revenue growth is higher than expected, is my margin also going to be higher, lower, or pretty close to expected? Now, most good Monte Carlo simulation packages allow you to build in correlations between the variables that you're modeling. And I built in that correlation. I built in a correlation between revenue growth and margins. The correlation I built in was when margins are higher, my, I'm sorry, growth is higher, margins are also more likely to be higher. As I said, the program that I use, and I'm, I'm not getting any commissions from selling it, but I like it, I've used it a lot. It's called Crystal Ball, it's an Oracle product. It's an add-on to Excel. So if you have a valuation that you've run on a spreadsheet, making it in simulation is almost effortless. You load up Crystal Ball and you get an additional menu where you can pick the distributions for each of, in this case, revenue growth and margins. You can define your output variable, which in this case is the value per share. You can tell it how many simulations you want to run. In this case, I've run 100,000 simulations. That'd be a little bit of an overkill, but it seems to take it very little time to run 100,000 or a million. And then I ran the simulation. He's saying, what did you find? I got a distribution of value per share for Apple. I don't know whether you remember, but my base case, point estimate valuation, I got a value of $126 plus for Apple. When I ran the simulations, and remember I ran 100,000 simulations, my median value is about 123. That's pretty close to what I caught with, the, caught with my point estimate, right? But are you surprised? Because if you think about it, the distributions were centered around the same expected value. So you're saying, why waste your time if you're going to get roughly the same number? But I'm learning a lot more, right? If you ask me, give me a range on Apple's value, I can say, look, with 80, you know, if you think about the, tenth, uh, 10 uh, the first decile and the ninth decile, the range in value for Apple is between 99 and 157. Remember I said the stock was trading around $93 per share? That's around the fifth, sixth percentile, maybe seventh percentile, which means there's a 93% chance that Apple is undervalued to the extent that my simulation is well-structured. 
I find it useful to not just look at the median value because that's very minimalist, but to pro look at the distribution of values, look at our, because remember that best case, worst case scenario we talked about, it's in here, right? My best case scenario is Apple is worth 415. My worst case, it's worth 81. This replaces a lot of the what if analyses, scenario analyses and simulations we often run when we do valuation. So I'm not suggesting that you pull out the Monte Carlo simulation from your toolkit for every analysis you do, but for those analyses where as you're doing the analyses, you're feeling uncertain, you're feeling uncomfortable because there's no way for you to reflect your uncertainty. Monte Carlo simulations allow you to look uncertainty in the face. Say, look, I'm uncertain. Let me show you how uncertain and let's let it play out. So basically, by taking a closer look at what you're afraid of, which is uncertainty, you become less fearful. So my advice to you is look into the abyss. It might not be as dark and dangerous as you think it is. And Monte Carlo simulations are now within your reach, even if you're an individual sitting at home with minimalist tools at your, um, th that you can reach for. I hope you found the session useful and thank you very much for listening.